Welcome back to another episode of Who The F***. It's the show that aims to take a deep dive into some of the acts playing across festival season 2020. Now we know that obviously that isn't happening and I haven't said this phrase in a long time. Today we're doing something a little bit different. If you've been following this channel then you'll see that I've been putting out a weekly show called Music Club FM. If you haven't seen that then go and check it out, it's a lot of fun. Alongside that, I do use something called a playcast, which is basically uh, I break down the chapters of me talking about said record and then I play the record, basically like a radio show, but it allows you to stream it on Spotify. I'm also gonna have this in video format as well on YouTube. You can click on the, the description below. We'll have a link to the playlist there, the playcast there. So you can kind of consume this in whatever medium you want to. Obviously, Reading and Leeds has been canceled this year and we, we covered that to, an ex to a massive extent last year. But there are just some bands that I really wanna cover and do WTF episodes about. But you can't just do a little one about them. So we've birthed the play, the playcast. That makes sense in terms of weekly format. For the bigger artists, I think it makes sense too. So, welcome back to another episode of Who The F*** It's the show that aims to take a deep dive in some of the acts playing across festival season 2020. Today's episode, we're looking at Idols. They're a punk band from Bristol. If you've never heard of them before, hopefully this show will help answer the question, Who the f*** are Idols? Well done. Why don't you get a job? Even Tarquin has a job. Mary Berry's got a job. Joe Talbot, Mark Bowen, Lee Kieran, Adam Devonshire and John Beavis are the five members that make up the punk band Idols. Now, before we go anywhere, punk band. In an interview I recently listened to with Joe from the band, uh, I believe it was on with, uh, with Zane Lowe, one of the things that's always got me, I've been saying for a long time, we're not a punk band. And you know when, when we started out, someone said, what kind of music do you make? And I always used to say recession soul. Using punk as an adjective is an insult to blues, calypso, to reggae, to everything that became before punk that was an epitome of subversive art in the face of adversity, which didn't start in 1975. I'm not gonna stand here and start attacking someone who used punk as an adjective, of course not. But it's always a point for me to say we're not a punk band. However, I think they have punk inspirations, regardless of whether that's calypso or reggae or British punk. Talbot was born in Newport in Wales, but spent his teenage years in Devon. He met Adam at a college in, in Devonshire, before moving to Bristol where they studied at University of West of England. It was at this point they decided to start a band. We all met for the Bristol music scene, DJing or whatnot. Dev and I were running an indie night called Batcave and decided we would start a band. We knew each other longer than the rest of the boys, so could put up with how fucking awful we were. Since then it's been beautiful. We hate each other half the time, but it's still beautiful. Some, that's an interview from Joe from the line of Best Fit. Bowen moved from Belfast to study, study in Bristol and Tower met on the DJ circuit. Genre-wise, they're described as alternative, rock, punk, post-hardcore, and I guess that literally is just aesthetically sounding. I, easy comparisons would be people like the Sex Pistols, but, you know, that's it's too obvious. They first came onto the scene with their Welcome EP. This was released on the 31st of December 2011 and was just recorded by Joe and Adam as a duo. It's much more different to their later albums. It's cleaner. It's not quite as aggressive in its approach. You would easily be able to compare it more to like the editors or Interpol. The idea of comparing idols to editors or Interpol sounds ridiculous. As a band, they've spoken about how much they hate that EP due to its aimless direction. It took us a long time to get productive because we didn't know what the fuck we were all doing. We were fucking terrible for a long time. Critics reviewed mainly constant across how it was a very safe sound and it was way more of a kind of post-punk revival as opposed to having their own identity. However, it's all right. I don't mind it as an, as an album. It's not too, as, a, as a record. It's not too bad. It, it's clearly, you, if you listen to this, you can hear the kind of foundations of where Idol started. Um, this is Mayday. Falling on the bathroom floor, tired of rising shore. They released their second EP, the Meat EP, in 2015. The first single of which was The Idol's Chant, which was debuted on the BBC Introducing West in September 2014. And really feels like a foundation for the rest of their sound. It feels like the first page of the new chapter. The first official single taken from the EP was the song Queens. The music video features a naked man wearing a wrestling mask while eating a bowl of eggs. It's not for anyone like that has a weak stomach. The staff of Crag described the music as confusing and disturbing. The EP would go on to feature other records, Romantic Gestures and Nice Man. In describing the EP and its name, Joe would go on to say, it's called me because the word was at the front of my mind after we recorded it. 
Like many things that just seem to pop up, it was perfect. Meat, it's a word that sums up the exist our existence perfectly. We're all lumps of imperfect meat. In the same interview, Joel went on to say, what's next for idols? In the words of Winf Wilfred Penfold, we're going to work hard and be nice people. Plus an EP, four albums, a knife fight, and a hip hop side project called Millennium Colkin. The record that we're gonna play to sum up this part is the Idols Chant. I remember them playing this when I saw them at Reading and Leeds. It was absolutely brilliant and yeah, it really feels like the start for them and their sound. Enjoy. In 2015, they started recording their debut album, Brutalism. The first record that I want to play for Brutalism is the record Mother, a record that deconstructs the term motherfucker. Metaphorically, the record discusses how society f***ed his mother over by forcing her to work ridiculous hours, a lot of which not being paid for, just so she could provide for her children. In an interview with Bristol 24-7, I grew up in Devon where sexism is still a funny thing to shout around in bars. Mother-in-law jokes are still funny down there. I was like, hold on. My mum worked 15 hours a day to make sure I'm comfortable. Why are we making jokes about women? It's just not okay. Not that a woman's worth is measured by her labour, it just triggered recognition on my part and made me want to explore gender inequality. Without my mum, I would be fucking dead. Literally speaking, he discusses how little empathy men have for women towards sexual assault. This is made very clear in the verse, sexual violence doesn't start and end with rape, it starts in our books and behind our school gates. Men are scared that women will laugh in their face. Women are scared it's their lives men will take. I borrowed lyrics from Margaret Atwood, reworked them a bit to fit the song. It's just about the idea that there's a huge difference in power of roles in relationships of fears and difference in sexes. Joe's mother died during the recording of the album after a long fight with illness and his time caring for her and her death had a major impact on the album. He stated that the songs on the album are to do with the roles of women in my life. It's also to do with the role my mum played pre and post mortem and also about progression and grief as a theme and eventual rebuilding. Talbot later speaking about the album said that she was the album. That's why she's on the cover. A limited edition 100 piece LP was cut in October 2017 which would actually feature the ashes of his mum pressed into the vinyl. This record is by far one of my favourite records by them as a band, if not by, like, of any band. It's absolutely incredible. This is the incredible mother. Next, I want to talk about Rachel Koo, which was the first song I heard by them. When talking about the record, Rachel Koo, Tabba says, It was supposed to be a love song dedicated to nihilistic drug adult mornings of wishing for a better future after sadly wasting an opportunity of one. Instead, it's just a stupid f***ing song, but I like it. The record also references Lonnie Dogan's My Old Man's a Dustman with the lyric. My old man's a dustman, he's a sculptor by his trade. He always wears the trousers and carves with a hardy spade. My father has been, always been supportive about anything I do. As long as I'm happy and I'm not harming anyone else, he's an artist that understands and taught me really how to work hard at something you love. He taught me a lot about creating in general. The sculpture on the cover was, it was built by my dad in his studio to resemble a brutalistic structure and also a headstone. I love that photo of my mum, it's one that my dad took. It's like a catharsis to go back to the only person I could rely on in this situation, which was my dad. He was the only other person person who knew my mum as well as I did. We've built something together and it's the cover of that and that's some powerful stuff. The next record I'm going to talk about is 1049 Gotho. I was constantly getting told guitar music is dying, getting told you're pissing in the wind, Talbot admits. At times I felt like a sad guy in the corner being like, it's still there, it's still there. What I think we've done, and what I tried to instill in the other guys, is not to worry about what every other c is doing. Don't worry about people going, come on man, it's time to get a job. Get your f***ing boots ready and get tight as f*** for the next gig. And when that's done, write another song instead of worrying about the big picture. Build up momentum. That patience and passion to go song by song means we haven't been distracted, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've done it for so long. Without any gratification, it comes down to our reception live. That's not a lie. People love our live shows. I can, Karen, I can confer their live shows are amazing. I'm going to finish off the brutalism section here with the record 1049 Gotho, uh, a record that openly discusses depression. The title is named after the largest asteroid that orbits the Earth or the Sun. In an interview for Music on Riots, Jay said, it came from a conversation about what to call it. I mentioned an analogy of depression a friend used referring to huge black shadow surrounding you all the time that is cripplingly heavy, but not seen by others. Weirdly, Bowen heard this and said, Gotho, someone later Google the word and so 1049 Gotho appeared. I love that strange coincidence. What's better to imagine depression than a huge asteroid hurtling towards you with no escape, but collision itself. 
In 2017, the band would go on to support the Maccabees in their final shows. I went to both of those gigs at Alexandra Palace and it was absolutely amazing. I also went to see them play on the Festival Public Stage at Reading in 2017. And they went on to support Foo Fires at the O2 in 2017. A gig they acquired by sending a jigsaw of the band. The image on the jigsaw was Adam in his pants holding a sign saying, Choose Idols. In 2018, they, respe they, re they returned with a monster record, Colossus, described as a blisteringly two-part rally against toxic masculinity. It's an exhilarating, deeply important return. The record was a massive return for the band. And when interviewed about the writing process, Joe said, we always write instrumentation democratically, always. We write it together, write each other's parts, and then I'll go away and write the lyrics. Once I've listened to the song like 100 to 200 times, I just write the lyrics down in one sitting and try to do the, try and do it as automatically as possible. Which is why the lines, I've drained my body full of pins just come out. He said noting that it's a metaphor for self-harm. I don't think about it, it just means a lot to me, but it's idiosyncratic to that very line. I don't go around using those phrases all the time, but I think it's supposed to be illustrative and confusing at the same time. The record's main goal is like a direct shot at toxic masculinity, with lines like, they laugh at me when I run, I waste away for fun, I don't want to be your man, and my personal favourite from it, I'm like Stone Cold Steve Austin, I put homophobes in coffins. This refers to American wrestler Stone Cold Steve Austin. When I first heard the lyric, I was just excited to hear him mention the song, I have to say, he was like a massive part of my childhood. Stone Cold Steve Austin is also known as the Texas Rattlesnake, right? He's a Texan wrestler. Um, since he's retired, he's started a brewery. When he was a wrestler, he would celebrate by coming down to the ring with his like 16 wheeler truck. He finished his match and he pour himself with Bud Light. He was like, like a manly, red-blooded American. However, he previously commented on same-sex marriage on his podcast. I'm for same-sex marriage. I believe that any human being in America and any human being in the world who wants to be married, if it's the same sex, more power to them. The line also refers to Steve Austin's famous match of The Undertaker, in which Stone Cold Steve Austin buried The Undertaker. That's how like, you won the match. That being said, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that The Undertaker's a homophobe. I just think that it just worked well for the song. And finally, until I was doing the research for this, I didn't quite realise how cool it is, but the lyric, I'm like Reggie Cray, is a reference to the London gangster Reggie Cray, or the Cray Twins. You may also know them as the two characters that Tom Hardy played in the film Legend. It's a very good film, go watch that. Um, the two of them were the biggest perpetrators of organised crime in the 50s and 60s. And the record is all about challenging toxic masculinity. So the reference to Reggie Cray is about him being gay, whilst also being the most feared gangster in London. And whilst the Cray twins have been con been convicted of some absolutely heinous and atrocious crimes, the lyric enforces the notion that no man needs to conform to any predetermined path. And it's just an amazing start to their second album. They followed Colossus up with Danny Nadelko, which has gone on to be probably their biggest record. Danny Nadelko is a Ukrainian immigrant. He's the front man of Bristol band Heavy Lungs. Danny himself features in the music video for the song wearing the t-shirt, No One Is An Island. The song's lyrics are taking aim at a heavily, heavily critical nationalism, while making the focus of the song more of a celebration of multiculturalism and diversity. The song came about in the belly of the album. We were in full swing of joy, and the momentum of the song summed up the spirit of our union. I promised Danny Nadalco I'd write a song for him and him for me. The tone comes from Danny and the lyrics come as though as a thought of his exuberance and how important people like Danny are. I think of this one more as a humane portrait than a political song, but I wanted the two notions to be inseparable. The main idea is that we are all humans and we're all equal, with no regard to race or origin, especially with lyrics. He's made of bones, he's made of blood, he's made of flesh, he's made of love, he's made of you, he's made of me. Unity. The song celebrates immigrants from Freddie Mercury to the local Polish butcher and even has a Star Wars reference. My little brother helped write this one, so this is hilarious. The line is referencing Yoda from Star Wars, describing the path that leads the Jedi towards the dark side. In this instance, it refers to how nationalist people's fear of immigration leads to nationalistic groups and hate towards immigration. The fear has been stoked by bad faith actors and politicians, which led us to this current state in our politics. We have Brexit because of this. Whereas this is not a direct quote from The Phantom Menace, it's not canon. Talbot has recorded the phrase to better suit the slippery slope rhetoric. 
Fear leads to panic, panic leads to pain, pain leads to anger, and anger leads to hate. The cover of the single reads, Rome wasn't built in a day, nor solely by Romans, referring to the civilization of ancient Rome that was not only built by the Romans, but by the thousands of slaves from all over Europe and the Mediterranean, including Gaul, Hispanic, North Africa, Syria, Germany, Britannia, the Balak. Bal Balkans and Greece. The companion song is the record Blood Brother by Herbie Lungs, which is written about Talbot by Nadalco. During the bridge of the record, Talbot spells out the word Danny Nadalco community, so f you. A possible reference to Sharpshooter, The Jungle Trap by Ganja Crew, the samples LL Cool J. I mean, it also in the record Great, they talk of one of the open lyrics is Listen to More Jungle. So we know that they're a big fan of jungle music, and who wouldn't be, right? Like, classic jungle is amazing. This is the incredible Danny Nadalco. The next record is probably my favourite record on this album, and it's the incredible Never Fight a Man with a Perm. In an interview with Kerrang! magazine, Joe said, I wanted to add a different part to the palette to where I was and where I was going, reflecting on the darker points of my history. I used to be a real piece of shit, and I used to be surrounded by that sort of behaviour. Violent behaviour that was through boredom. I was surrounded by these really angry men, and I wanted to reflect how ludicrous it was. It was also to give some people a bit of advice to never start a fight with a man with a perm. I'll tell you that for nothing. The verses in the track aim to describe the type of person through some really simple phrases. Real cream, creatine and a bag of Charlie Sheen. Brill Cream is a men's hair product synonymous with old school gangsters and has been an icon since 1928, perhaps referring to the type of people who derive their values of race and religion from the same time. Creatine is the organic acid that your muscles use to make energy. Charlie Sheen is a slang for cocaine after his breakdown in 2011. The three of these put together paints this image of this superficial, hyper-masculine muscle head. And this continues in the second verse slightly differently a heathen from Eton on a bag of Michael Keaton. Eton obviously being like a prestigious school that's synonymous with the upper class. Um, many of the UK's prime ministers have been bred from, from Eton. David Cameron went there, Boris Johnson went there. The lyric, these boots are made for stomping and that's what I'll just what I'll do. One of these days these boots are gonna stomp all over you. Kind of references the Nancy, Nancy Sinatra song, these boots are made for walking, but also covers the same kind of reggae punk band Simarip with their record, these boots are made for stomping it kind of implies the aggressive nature of like Mr. Hypermasculine but also it gives this impression of like mocking them so they're gonna like just stomp around act like a child this line links to the chorus concrete and leather which refers to the idea of boots stomping on the ground and exaggerating the kind of violent behavior also you have lyrics like you think you're suave you're not suave because you watch get Carter you're a catalog plastic Sinatra a tryhard who should have tried harder this refers to the Michael Caine film get Carter popular among kind of like smooth English wannabe hard gangster types who thinks it's enough for them to like watch the film and become cultured like that's fine like, I think it's important that you watch Michael Caine films he's an amazing actor this is no disrespect to Michael Caine but like you know you get me the outro outlines a theme that's persistent in the whole second album optimism in the face of all dangers that threaten our society especially pertaining to men I shut my mouth let's hang it let's hug it out these lines demonstrate and we'll go over this later on in, in, in a couple more recent records of theirs but these lines demonstrate the affection and compromise towards like a nemesis the lines kind of show that this aggressive behavior and hyper masculinity shouldn't be met with more of this behavior and more hyper masculinity but with love and vulnerability and empathy as opposed to hate and stoicism this is the incredible never fight a man with a perm <laughs> And closing off Joy is an Act of Resistance, the whole album is amazing to so go and listen to it, but we're just going to finish off with Rottweiler because it's one of the most played songs live. Closing the track on the second album, however, has been performed as early as 2016. Talbot told Gigwise that it was the first track written after Brutalism was finished. A lot of these people were deprived of the opportunity to work for a living or have, have access to housing. Lots of things that the government stripped of them. The government then illegally used the tabloids to blame the whole thing all on immigrants. It's what right-wing politicians do all over the world and have done forever. Joe Talbot, for the best of life fit, when 
asked about why some people mistakenly voted for Brexit. This track is about Talbot's dislike for the tabloids. I join him on this, which he's publicly spoken about as he believes that they're used to blame minority groups for government issues. And just go back and look at all of this. This is just throughout history. This is the problem. We have stupid bullshit that holds us back because some tabloid wants to blame it on people that don't look like us. This is an anti-fascist song. Don't read the sun, I'll give you, it'll give you cancer. Joe Talbot's introducing the song at their 2019 Glastonbury set. The record, there's a vulture in my breakfast table, people think I'm insane, refers to the vulture-like nature of the tabloids in the papers, with agendas such as the sun, daily mail and the express. Tabloids preying on the weak, much like vultures, many people read the paper at the breakfast table. The sound's outro is of, the, of like an angry, shouty nature. It basically exaggerates the tabloids' goals to just like, make people destroy the world. It's also a comment on how people could be led to believe anything they want. They're e easily influenced when put under pressure. Keep going, keep f***ing going, keep going, f*** them, f*** them, go, smash it, ruin it, destroy the world, burn your house down. They use this technique of going after you and making you agree with one of their little pieces and then just pushing you to hate more and more. And it's a wonderful record to finish off this album. This is the incredible Rottweiler. Following Joy as an actor resistant, the band managed to gain significant traction. Danny Delco was getting regular plays on Radio 1, like during the day. The audience was growing exponentially. This culminated in a very touching and emotional performance at Glastonbury in 2019 during their performance of Danny Delco. You can go and watch that on YouTube, it's absolutely amazing. Following this, they also went on to get nominated for the 2019 Mercury Music Prize alongside Foles, Slow Tie, Fontaine's DC, Little Sims, 1975, and winner Dave. They performed Never Fight a Man with a Perm on the night. It was the loudest of the evening. And in December 2019, they released their, their live album, A Beautiful Thing, live at the Bataclan. The Bataclan obviously was the venue that fell victim to the terrorist attacks in November 2015 during an Eagles of Death Metal gig. Many people were killed whilst watching a gig and it haunts me still to this day. In May 2020, in a Louder Sound article, Tabo was quoted saying, we wanted to start this journey with a means to not only encapsulate the album sentiment, but to encourage our audience to dance like no one is watching and plow through these dark times with the two-time mache of a song with the most beautiful community of scumbags ever assembled. Let's go, all is love. They then put out the record, Miss the Motivator. The, the track is the first teaser for the upcoming Idols project, Ultra Mono, produced by Nick Lawney and Kenny Beats. Kenny is known for being a fan of Idols sporting merch in his videos on his YouTube channel. Obviously, he has a huge background in hip hop. We covered Kenny Beats when he talked when he um, worked with Denzel Curry, amongst many other incredible rappers. The record itself is about motivation. They're starting as they mean to go on, getting the audience hyped for what's coming. We're ready for a new Idols, and this is such an Idols tune. The track features several cliches, like Kathleen Hanna, a prominent feminist figure, grabbing Trump by the pussy, like into the Justin quote from him seven, several years ago. Flavor Flav riding John Wayne on like a horse, Wayne being a symbolist, a symbol of toxic masculinity and white supremacy, and Freda Kao, a Mexican painter, painting arm the poor on your f off wall, a reference to Trump's attempt to erect a wall on the US border of Mexico, and things like, you know, Conor McGregor with a samurai sword on rollerblades, like it just, some some of these make no sense at all, but they're kind of hilarious. They culminize with the lyric, how do you like them cliches, which has two kind of parts, right? It's, it's the kind of portrayal of pop characters, but it's also kind of a backhanded compliment to critics of theirs calling them a motto band making simple catchy lyrics with records like well done or motherfucker and it finish, finishes with the record your joke how fucking zaggy who's obviously known for being an underdog all in all bit of a hero this is the brilliant mr motivator Go on to follow up this record with the brilliant Grounds. In an interview with The Enemy in twenty in June 2020, Talbot described the record as a song that embodied self-belief and gave us self-belief. A counterpunch to all the doubt we've built up over from all the noise we so easily let in. We wanted to make the sound of our own hearts marching band, armed with a jackhammer and a smile. We wanted to make the sound of our engine starting, so we did. Thank you. Grounds is the second release from the upcoming Idols project, uh, Ultra Mono. The music video features Joe and is, is filmed in the Bristol area. A lot of the lyrics in the song have to do with imperialism, unifying against oppressors, and another stab at the UK tabloid, The Sun, with the lyric, you will not catch me staring at the sun. Equally, this could be in reference to Donald Trump staring at the sun without 
the glasses during the the, uh, the solar eclipse. A third one is being like the sun blinds them. I don't know. There's all sorts of double meanings here. The lyrics, "Do you hear that thunder?" It's the sound of strength in numbers. I guess kind of could allude to the fact that they're kind of building towards this new project and they sound much bigger and bolshier and they're kind of working themselves up with that engine that they discussed earlier. But also could you know, I think probably it, it shows the importance of protest and seeing that people getting together for the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, shows the strength that you have within numbers. The record itself for me is one that I, I just really enjoy. It's it, it's a really good follow-up record. It sounds a bit different for them, but it's just big and heavy from like a an aesthetic point of view. It's just massive and yeah, just leads you into this wonderful, wonderful false sense of security. It is brilliant. This is Grounds. And most recently, they collaborated with the incredible Mike Skinner on the street's latest project, None of Us Are Getting Out of This Life Alive. This features vocals from both Talbot and Mike Skinner, and an incredible Kurt Abeka, courtesy of the band. This is what it looks like when you merge a big, bullshy band with the production of a grime record. Something that the band actually have spoken out about quite heavily, being inspired by grime and the, its delivery, most, most specifically with their record Well Done, which has a really simple theme running over and over again through it. In an interview with the NME asking about how, how the record came about, Mike Skinner said, I just reached out and thank God they answered. They all came down and they rehearsed and rehearsed all day. Coming from dance and rap where, you, where you're constantly fiddling, through the band it feels like you're not doing anything all day, just practicing, and then at the end of the day you press record and it's done. Lyrics in this record really resonate with me. The opening one for Mike Skinner, I'm hard to love, I make idiot jokes, but those are the, those the hardest to love are the ones that need it the most. This line resonates with me a lot. I've met a lot of people in my life from different walks of life, from different political views views, right? Like, and some people manifest their views or their insecurities in their humour, and sometimes that comes out as inappropriate, sometimes that's racist or homophobic or sexist, some people blame that on their upbringing or blame that on something negative that's happened to them in the past, and they kind of just use their excuse if they have a dark sense of humour to allow them to behave that way. And some people are really quick to ostracise those people. They said something I don't agree with, I'm never speaking to them again, or I don't value value your opinion because of this. When actually they're the people who need love to be loved a bit more. By the time Talbot comes into the record, he starts mirroring Skinner's chorus in a very traditional kind of hip hop fashion. Uh, very mixtape, I love it. The lyric then follows up with, that's why I won't, I don't go gentle into the night, which is a reference to the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, while making sure you make the most out of life. It follows up with the lyric, I twinkle like the blade in the belly of the right, indicating that he's the thorn in the side of the right wing, obviously, but if you haven't worked up at this point, then they're kind of quite a progressive level wing band idols and lyrics never out like an Audi driver never mixed with the drink spikers never seen with the seat pisses refers to the kind of worst people in society oh you drive an Audi you must drive like an idiot you uh, the worst people piss on seats and of course something like someone who spikes a drink we see as the worst people in the entire world but I guarantee everyone has met someone that has done that because it happens all the time this backs up what I was saying earlier the, about the people that need the love the most Whilst both the work of Idols and Mike Skinner are very progressive and forward-thinking and uh, liberal, and they act as an incredible commentary on our country at the moment, this record feels like a bit of a reminder that outcasting and ostracising doesn't get anyone anywhere. Well, that's what that's what I take from this record anyway. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful record. This is Nobody Getting Out of This Life Alive, featuring Idols by the streets. None of us are getting out of this life alive. None of us are getting out of this life alive. That is, that's 15 tracks there. This is this brings us to the end of WTF, uh, to the end of this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun to um, research. I kind of just felt like there were some acts that required a little bit more. My favorite WTF episodes last year were people like Frank Carter and Enter Shikari. I love doing Foo Fighters. I love doing the 1975, going back in into the deep diary of it and, and just kind of discovering a bit more. So those 15 records are the essentials, the get to know idols, the who the f*** are idols. The playlist carries on. If you have enjoyed where you're at so far, there are some amazing other records which I, I would love to talk about and are amazing, but just they sit 
separate to those 15 for me. I didn't want to make it too long. Records like Samaritans, Great, I Dream Guillotine, Mercedes Marxist, all absolutely incredible records, along with their amazing remix of Wedding Bells by Metronomy, which we hammered um, towards the start of the year when we covered Metronomy and WTF. They're an incredible, incredible act. I really hope they're brought back for next year's festival because they are amazing. I'm really looking forward to the upcoming album, Ultra Mono. I'll also add their newest single, which has just, just come out as well, into that bit as well. And we'll update this playlist as time goes on. As new albums come out, we'll continue to update that playlist as well. That playcast will exist and stay there forever. And we'll just keep adding to it as they grow as a band. But I hope you really enjoyed this this episode. It's been a lot of fun to put together. Um, let me know your thoughts on them as a band. Are they a band that you would like to go see again? Are you hoping they're gonna play a Reading of 2021? I really hope that that's the case. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. As always, send me an Instagram DM or tweet me at Keelface. Yeah, uh, you know, I'd like to hear from you all. I'll leave you with some more idols. Cheers, bye.